Hello, everyone. Not sure if everybody can hear me yet. Um, we're going to give a minute or two here to let some folks continue to log in. But uh, an early thank you to everyone for joining us here. We'll get started here uh, in a minute or so. Greetings, everybody. I apologize for um, being a little bit late. It's one of those mornings. My name is Eric Miller, um, and I think the rest of my uh, co-presenters are here on the line. Eric Coder, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Hey, thanks for thanks Very for good. joining, Eric. I appreciate having you help uh, co-present with me here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now that you're in, um, and we've been here for a few minutes, um, mm -hmm. I think it's safe for us to get started. Um, right. So, yeah, let's get going here, everybody. Um, first off, my name is Eric Coder. I'm the ANSYS account manager here at PADT, who's had the fortune of working with URSA Major Technologies uh, as the account manager. Uh, URSA Major is based here in Colorado, uh, where I am as well. Um, and URSA Major um, has a pretty unique and, and awesome story uh, how ANSYS and PADT have been able to help um, them in their um, mission to disrupt the rocket engine industry um, with some really unique technologies that they are bringing to bear in the market. And um, so the essence of the story we're telling here today is that of, of URSA Major. But, um, you know, as, a, as a, an agenda goes here, uh, I, I suppose I can slide over to uh, our agenda slide. <laughs> and overview what we're going to cover here on today's call. Um, so we'll first introduce PADT and, um, you know, go over uh, URSA Major at a high level, but we'll let them explain themselves more as they get into their component of the uh, presentation today. Um, and then uh, after, you know, this introduction is complete, I'm going to hand it over to Eric Miller to help with the overview of the uh, ANSYS use in the aerospace and defense industry. Um, and then that, again, we'll uh, hand the, the ball off to the, the folks from URSA Major, for which um, we've got, um, I believe, five presenters, one, two, three, four, five of us uh, from URSA Major here, uh, to cover the various aspects in which um, they've all um, had intimate use of, uh, of a several ANSYS technologies. So everything from FEA to CFD to use of the new ANSYS additive suite for 3D printing with metal. Um, those have all been um, integral and vital to uh, URSA Major's optimization of their technology, and uh, we'll let them explain that in greater detail. Then we can dive into a Q&A session and um, answer any questions you guys may have for PADT or URSA Major. And then if time permits here, um, we'll uh, also address one of the new uh, offerings from ANSYS that has actually been very valuable here in these times of COVID, um, the ANSYS cloud. So uh, really a versatile way of, of utilizing uh, ANSYS technologies via the cloud. Um, and that's something we'd be glad to share with you guys. If we can't cover that um, in advance, 
or uh, I'm sorry, by the end of the uh, presentation time that we've set aside here, um, you can always uh, hit us up with more questions on that uh, after the fact. So with that said, Eric, I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, and uh, thanks, everyone, again, for joining. Great. We look forward to uh, sharing all this with you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Eric Coder. Um, I, I made a pledge when we started the company that I would never hire somebody with my name, and unfortunately, he does his job well, so we have to keep him around. So it's confusing sometimes. Um, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about uh, our company, Phoenix Analysis and Design Technologies, where uh, our slogan is, we make innovation. Um, we were founded. I was one of the founders uh, in 1994. There were four of us that were working at what is now Allied, uh, Honeywell Engines, was Allied Signal back in the day, um, Garrett before that. And uh, we were doing numerical simulation, product development, and 3D printing using some new computer-aided engineering tools that we thought were slick enough to build the business around. And um, that's kind of still what we do today. We provide sales, support, and services which is consulting basically for simulation, product development, and 3D printing. We're based in Tempe, Arizona, at the ASU Research Park there, although most of us are based out of our homes right now, uh, with offices in California, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Texas. We're about 85-ish employees spread out all the way from Texas to California. So very, very, uh, very um, diverse group of people and uh, quite a wide territory that we cover. Let's talk a little bit about that one area of the company that we're here to talk about today, which is numerical simulation. Uh, we are an ANSYS, very proud to be an ANSYS elite channel partner. We've been an ANSYS channel partner for some time, uh, since very early in the history of the company. And um, it's, it's the well, one thing we, uh, it's, a, it's a very important part of our business. Um, uh, if not the biggest part, I think it is the biggest part in a lot of different measures, but it's also kind of the core of what we do because two of the three founders that are still with the company we started our career uh, as ANSYS users, so it's, it's near and dear to our hearts. We also saw a product called Flonex, which is a 1D thermal fluid solving code, and we have various uh, solutions for high-performance computing. On the support side, if you're lucky enough to be purchasing your ANSYS from PADT, uh, we provide frontline technical support, so you call, email, or in other ways engage with us, and we will help you. The, the difference between our support and most others is you're going to be talking to a consulting engineer with lots of experience. They also provide training and mentoring, which is really one-on-one -on -one training. And then our services group, our consulting group, uh, does basically, if ANSYS will solve it, we'll do it for a consulting basis. Uh, we're mostly these days doing uh, complex stress and vibration, uh, a lot of impact, a lot of LS Dyna work recently, and then we've, we've been doing consistently a lot of CFD fluid flow work across multiple industries for a very long time. We also do electromagnetics, both low and high frequency, and multi-physics where we combine it all. And uh, thermal seems to always find its way into everything we do as well. So um, we have a really great group of people. Another thing I'll mention on the services side for this audience is we do a lot of customization as well. So we'll work with companies that maybe want to have an ACT extension or custom uh, material model or a new turbulence model uh, for something. So, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a cool uh, thing if you're a simulation engineer to, to uh, do that, and we have a lot of fun with it. Uh, so it's an important part of our business. It keeps us fresh on the sales side. When it comes to ANSYS sales, uh, you can kind of see a, it's a little small maybe on your screen, but you kind of see our latest map. Um, we're, we're inching our way across the western United States. Um, something I like to really point out is that we, uh, a couple of years ago, we won an award, a national award for the quality of our technical support, and that was based upon feedback from customers and surveys and things like that. And as I mentioned earlier, we are an elite channel partner. Something a little unique about us compared to most is we're, we're a very strong technical partner. We've, from day one, have worked closely with development. In fact, I think I still have some code in the ANSYS uh, APDL solver. I think Matt does as well, that we wrote way back in the day. Um, and so we're, we're very involved with them uh, from a planning and uh, strategic standpoint, as well as helping them out when we can. Um, you know, we have full physics capability as well. You may think of us as doing just fluids or just doing structural, but we do all the different physics. And our, I think our fastest growing part of our business is the high-frequency electromagnetics. 
and we're all about long-term relationships. We've we've had uh, 20 plus years working with the same customers and adding new ones all the time. And um, you know, our goal and what's worked for us from a business standpoint is to create long-term customer success. Um, as COVID has rolled through so many different aspects of all of our lives, those long-term relationships are really paying off for for us and our customers as we all work through this together. So it's been it's been great. So let's shift gears here. We talked about PADT. Um, let's talk about aerospace and defense. Um, so this survey, which was from Accenture, one of those companies that does such surveys, they, they asked, you know, what significant challenges exist to the realization of opportunities in the aerospace and defense? And 90% of them believe they have entered an era of what they consider exponential technology advancement. And I thought we had been through that already. Maybe it's a continuation, but it's amazing to me how much things are changing and how quickly they are changing from the technical standpoint. I mean, what we used to wait uh, maybe, I don't know, you know, years from a technology standpoint, we're now getting delivered in software or hardware in, in months, if, uh, uh, or maybe quarters, if it's taking a while. So one of the things that they talked about is the political, uh, the challenges they face political. Um, so, you know, that situation is driving defense spending and pushing for uh, more flexible and diverse uh, technology solution. Um, more, you know, it used to be just us and the Russians in space. Well, that's changing. So uh, the, the, and the economics of space is changing. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things, tariffs, raw material, is increasing um, some of the things that's impacting how we do engineering. Um, I think if I click, it'll go to the next one. Um, so faster technology insertion and productivity. For an economic standpoint, um, there's a lot of new aircraft programs, um, or a lack of new aircraft programs. So a lot of companies are pivoting to basically maintaining the existing fleet. We're certainly seeing that with our customer base. Um, Fuel efficiency, and this is true for military as well as commercial, uh, is a big driver uh, in, in the industry. And um, th there's, there's an increase in defense spending. That's a, just a reality of where we are today. So the economic impacts that people mentioned are listed there. Socially, um, <laughs> I think I fit into this because I'm 56, but capture and retain the knowledge from an aging workforce and training men or new engineers. It's certainly what a lot of us are dealing with, whether you're, you're that new engineer or whether you're that experienced person. Um, and uh, we've got these enhanced communication systems, right, that allow us to connect across the globe. Um, and, of course, we're seeing that now with the work from home, leveraging those quite heavily. Um, in the poll, they also talk about technology. So what are the disruptions coming in, in, in technology? And this, this impacts all aspects of aerospace and defense. The, the big ones are autonomy, you know, so, so whether it's a drone or a vehicle. Electrification, of course, replacing internal combustion and maybe gas turbine with electrical. 5G from a communication standpoint is, is having impacts across the sector. And then, of course, we're getting new materials and, and what we love at PADC, additive manufacturing. One of the ways that this is manifesting itself, and it's more than just a buzzword, is this idea of the digital enterprise, is that developing a product in the aerospace defense industry is about creating a digital um, representation of that product and operating the function all the way from concept through manufacturing and, and life cycle management as a digital experience. So that's changing everything. Legally, um, the, the, it's, it's interesting the respondents said it was meeting noise and emissions policies and regulations is something that they're facing challenges on. I think commercial especially. I don't know if that impacts the, mil the military as much or the space as much, or commercial aviation as well. Um, and, and getting safety certification done faster is a big, big need. Uh, environmentally, um, there's a big push uh, to develop alternative fluids, fluids, more efficient propulsion systems. And a big thing that we do in aerospace, right, if we want to reduce the amount of fuel fluid, is we want to a fuel, we've got to reduce the amount of weight that we're carrying and get more aerodynamic efficiency. Uh, that's, that's one way to impact the environment uh, as well. And from a competition standpoint, um, you know, 
there's a new space race out there, and we're going to talk about that a lot with, uh, with our special guests today. So um, there, there's growing markets outside of the U.S. and Europe, and um, there's disruptors out there. I think, you know, there's companies like SpaceX and hopefully Ursa Major who are going to shake up the, the, the tree, right, and, and, and get the, some of these more stodgy companies that have to wake up and do things better and differently. Certainly have seen that. They need to reduce costs, accelerate insertion, and innovate. So that's kind of what, what uh, the, the things that are going on in the industry, which I think you all are probably aware of. And uh, we feel that simulation plays a, a significant role in addressing each and every one of those, right? So if we look at the summaries of them, um, you know, we want to get new products out there sooner. We want to have these improvements in how things operate in the field and, and reduce costs. We, of course, want to have uh, better products and, and closer customer relationships. Um, the whole idea of using digital twins and big data to do predictive and prescriptive maintenance is, is a huge disruptor that's happening. And uh, using that data as well to get new revenue streams uh, is something that companies are looking at. And, in, and simulation, um, really impacts each and every one of those in different ways. And, and you can, of course, the, the last two may be the biggest because we can use simulation to generate the data we're using for predictive and descriptive models or to do new revenue from the data. We can also, when we do something predictive or prescriptive, we can try it out using simulation. Um, and we've, we've known for a very long time that simulation helps get products to market faster and makes better products and gets cost out. So that, that hasn't changed uh, in any way. So we talk about, you, you, you've probably heard this, this uh, word for, uh, for a while from ANSYS about pervasive simulation. So simulation is pervasive in that it is used and adds value across the life cycle. You know, you're, what we used to call um, uh, the innovation phase, I guess the discover phase, this is where you're really trying to understand the, what the needs are, what the requirements are, and things like that. Simulation, of course, plays a role to look at that. Design, it, we've been driving design for quite some time uh, using simulation. It's probably the largest usage. But in manufacturing, we're seeing more and more usage of simulation to model the manufacturing process, heat treat, metal forming, and of course, in additive, we're seeing more use. Um, there's, there's so many, and, and simulating the manufacturing process, right? With, how can we effectively um, create uh, the part more efficiently and faster? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a key part of what we're doing using simulation. And then modeling the operating system as well, um, how things operate in the field. So it's pervasive. It's everywhere. So the industry continues to focus uh, on these key business initiatives. Now, this slide was done before um, the spiky ball of death completely gutted the commercial aviation industry. So uh, some of these slides may change once we understand the full impact. But before that happened, um, you know, we're really focused on these quieter, more fuel efficient, um, uh, uh, friendly aircraft. Maintenance, repair, and overhaul. Uh, revenue growth is key to these companies. Improving the safety uh, and passenger experience and lowering the, the costs involved in, in not just creating the aircraft, but the operating them. So that's, that's the big drivers there. On the defense side, um, getting these next generation systems and technologies out to the warfighter as soon as possible, um, and having the flexibility and adaptability. We're not just designing systems for one type of war. We've got five or six different types of war that we're dealing with, um, keeping those those uh, costs down for the life cycle of a product, um, making the product last longer, right? I mean, who the people that designed the B-52 probably never thought that their grandchildren would be flying it, but they are. And we've done really, really good uh, job at that. And simulation, of course, plays a big role in that. And, uh, you know, what we're, what we're talking about here is defense. It's, it's about lethality, um, keeping our people safe and secure. And, uh, and now, uh, being un undetected. So stealth is really important. We're going to talk about a lot more today is space. Um, what a boom. What, who would have thought, um, you know, we're, we're going to have our first commercial crew launch, I think this week, um, if all goes well from SpaceX. So who would have thought that would have happened uh, 
So we're going to see more frequent launches and commercialization. Satellite miniaturization, many on the call may be involved in that. I mean, I'm amazed at how much they pack into these tiny little sats. Um, I, I knew it was becoming a reality. Lots of small satellites were becoming a reality when I went to an event with a lot of astronomers, and they are very upset that there's so many of these little satellites out there that it's actually impacting their ability to um, look into the skies. Uh, and that's how much is going on in commercial space. And, and advanced telecommunications observation and exploration capabilities. These are, these are all things that happen in space. We, we forget that the Internet oftentimes goes up through satellites and around, and, and more and more of that is going to be happening as time goes. So how do we win this new space race? Uh, we want to really accelerate innovation. So as an example of uh, eight months saved in uh, a pre-design phase, a company uh, used simulation um, two months of, uh, to save two months in structural ground testing and six months of thermal ground testing. Um, so that, that's something that I'm sure all of you on the call have dealt with and, and seen the advantage of with time uh, and, and optimizing the design through it all. So not only do they make sure that the design worked, they optimize that design. Uh, from an additive standpoint, uh, which of course is near to near to our heart here at PADT, you can get anywhere from 10 to 100 times uh, reduction in the volume of material. And, and I do notice they say volume and not uh, mass. So it's, we're, we're doing some, some things um, playing with, with uh, even maybe getting weight out, more weight out than, than volume. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty cool some of the things we can do with additive. So taking multi-piece assemblies and turning them into a single part um, and um, changing the geometry to get, because oftentimes our geometry is dictated by the manufacturing process with the freedom of additive um, and the power of simulation to, to drive at the design and the optimized design and simulate the manufacturing process, we can get a huge amount of weight out of these things. Um, and boy, we're going to talk about it today. We're going to talk about propulsion, but anytime you can get a reduction in temperature on a propulsion side, that's a fantastic thing. Um, so as, as we know, the plumes that come out of these engines um, can be very, very sophisticated, and understanding that and reducing the temperature gradients uh, and cooling the parts that need to be cooled is, is such a key part of propulsion design. We'll, of course, talk about that more with our friends who do propulsion design. Which leads me right to where I am. So uh, I'll hand it back to you, uh, Eric, and uh, introduce our customers here from uh, our friends from URSA Major. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. Um, you can certainly speak to the industry on whole uh, amongst the best of them, so we, uh, we appreciate your time here. Um, now, yeah, let's hand it over to URSA Majors so they can kind of tell their story on how um, they see their engine um, design um, and ANSYS being integral to that, uh, you know, and so how they're going to disrupt, disrupt the uh, uh, rocket engine industry with uh, some some technologies that they've developed that have been, um, you know, I think that we can safely say that ANSYS has uh, played a vital role in. So with that, let me just hand it over to Bill Murray here. Um, and Bill, you can kind of overview um, who all you have on the call here on your side and then and take it away. Perfect. Uh, yeah, as, as Eric said, uh, my name is Bill Murray. I'm the Director of Design and Analysis at Earth Major. I've got with me um, four other people here, uh, Scott Walsh, uh, Director of Turbo Machinery, Ian Shannon, uh, FEA Analyst, uh, Eddie Rondon, Senior FEA Analyst, and Young Peng Yang, uh, Staff CFD Analyst. And that's the uh, entirety of our analysis team here. And I'll give an introduction to the company and explain um, overview of Ursa Major and, and what we're here to do. And Scott will take it from here to describe our products and um, and exactly what makes them tick. So uh, as far as personal introduction, I've been here since the start of the company in 2015. Uh, I came from Blue Origin before that and a uh, Purdue University grad and a USC grad. Um, and I've kind of been involved in a little bit of everything with the, with the engine development. Um, so I've been deeply involved with uh, analysis of the Hadley product uh, prior to the formation of our analysis team. Um, also been a designer on, on the product itself, mostly on the pre-burner, uh, as well as a couple other components on the engine. Um, 
So as far as the start of the company, um, we, we were started uh, via an angel investment round and began design on our first product for test in about October 2015. And that's Hadley you see here on this slide. Um, the slide is basically just a cartoon evolution of the product when it began uh, its early phase design all the way through uh, the first block release of the engine um, that we ended up selling to our first customer. So we started with six employees uh, roughly by the end of 2015, 2016 in Broomfield, Colorado. We're about 60, a little over 60 employees now. Um, our first Hadley was built in July of 2016, and that's our 5,000 pound thrust kerosene ox engine. Our test stand in Berthoud, Colorado was activated in fall of 2016, and our first Hadley test was in February 2017. Um, and as far as we know, that this is uh, the very first full engine test fire of an oxygen-rich stage combustion engine uh, developed and built in America. Um, and we went from basically the founding of the company to first uh, static fire in about 14, 16 months uh, with six people. Um, so we have several customers uh, spanning ranges between vertical and horizontal launch. Scott will get into detail on that in the next slide. Uh, we fully design almost all of our engine components minus some of the off-the-shelf hardware. So 100% of the combustor design and turbo machinery design is done in-house. Um, and the engine is 80% DMLS uh, 3D printed by mass. Um, so we utilize about every tool that we can get our hands on to help us design parts for additive, and ANSYS is a big part of that. Um, like I said, we, our main test facilities are in Berthoud, Colorado, um, and our engineering facilities in Lafayette. We also utilize testing at Purdue University. Um, we've, we've used ANSYS from day one, so we started with analysis work on the thrust chamber and injector, um, and then we started using mechanical and CFX for all turbo machinery analyses. It was pretty much uh, Scott and me at the time using ANSYS. Uh, we got going on rudimentary combustion CFD uh, for the pre-burner injector before the first static fire, but we've since evolved a lot. Um, now we employ three full-time analysts, and the primary uses are ANSYS Mechanical, uh, ANSYS CFX and Fluent, and ANSYS Space Claim. And uh, we do full detailed analysis on all engine and thrust stand hardware in-house. Um, so, like I said, on this, on this uh, slide here, um, we're basically trying to develop the highest performing, lowest cost, most reliable engines for launch and hypersonic applications. Um, we do have a lot more technical info on our website and Instagram if you guys are interested. So with that, I'll hand it over here to Scott and he can explain more about the products. Great. Thanks, Bill. So my name is Scott. Uh, I'm the Director of Turbo Machinery at URSA. Uh, I've been with the company since the very beginning, like Bill said, October 2015. Uh, at Ursa, we really strive to build high-performing, reliable engines uh, for our customers' unique applications. And as Bill mentioned, you know, we have applications from uh, boost all the way through horizontal flight um, hypersonics work. Uh, in order to accomplish that, the, the goal is to select the correct engine cycle from the start. And so we use a closed engine cycle for our rocket engines. So the difference between a closed engine cycle and an open engine cycle and a rocket engine is all about what happens to the turbine gas after it leaves the turbine. In an open cycle, that gas is dumped overboard, so you don't get very much or, or any useful thrust out of it. In a closed cycle like ours, that gas is used in the main combustion chamber for thrust. So it's a, while, while that is, it's a more difficult cycle to master, uh, it has an inherent performance advantage over the other open cycle engines. So we also use uh, scalable architecture, meaning that, as you can see on the left-hand side, we have a, a small Hadley on the left-hand side and a much bigger Ripley engine on the right-hand side. And the architecture of those engines is very, very similar. Some things don't quite scale when you go such, you know, such a drastic change from the 5,000-pound engine on the left to the 35,000-pound engine on the right. But in general, things scale well, the positioning and, uh, and mechanisms we use. Um, they, they, they scale well. And so that means that we're able to take lessons learned from one rocket engine program and apply them across all of our rocket engine programs well. So again, back to Hadley, which is the smaller rocket engine on the left-hand side. It's a 5,000-pound, ox-rich, staged combustion engine. 
And that means that our pre-burner and turbine operate in a high-pressure, oxygen-rich environment. So while this cycle is high-performing, because it's in a high-pressure, oxygen-rich environment, it has some other challenges um, associated with that. You can see uh, it's, it's difficult to see on the Hadley, but maybe you can see a little bit better on uh, Ripley that the turbo pump is stacked directly in line with the thrust chamber. Uh, this allows us to have a much smaller circumferential footprint for the engine, um, giving us more room for other things. Um, let's see. The, um, the other thing I wanted to mention was on both of these engines, we, have, uh, we do have fuel hydraulic actuation, so thrust vector control. And that just means that we're using kerosene, our, our fuel, as our um, hydraulic fluid to control the pointing vector of the rocket engine. So um, as Bill mentioned, most of these engines, a lot of these engines by mass are all additively manufactured. And that's, it, it's been an enabling technology for us because it's allowed us to take what would be uh, very complex assemblies and create them, analyze them, assemble them with much fewer components leading to lower cost and shorter lead time. It is a new manufacturing method, and so it has some other challenges associated with it. Um, but, the, you know, we're exploring, you know, Ansys products that are helping us with some of the challenges, and we'll talk about those in a couple of slides. One of the other things I wanted to mention that we do best at URSA is test. So the image at the bottom right is uh, our stand A. Uh, we, we test Hadley on that stand, the smaller the two rocket engines. Uh, on that stand, we've completed over 500 tests and thousands of seconds of, of uh, run time. So having that in-house, having that available to our, you know, solely dedicated to one engine program and not an outside resource has been a huge benefit to us and enabled us to move fast, make changes, and uh, experiment with our, with our technology. Top right picture is test and B that was completed earlier this year. Uh, it has the capability of uh, testing both Ripley and Hadley. So it could be a second test stand for, for Hadley if we need it. And currently it's pictured in the Ripley configuration. So uh, brief update, Ripley testing uh, started on that stand earlier this year. So in the next sections, uh, we're going to let some other people talk. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some of the detailed analysis we do in order to make these rocket engines function. Ian's going to start off talking about topology optimization and one particular application of that method we've used recently. Then Ian will also discuss uh, simulating the SLS or DMLS process using the ANSYS tool to allow us to get better products better surface finish and better material properties out of those prints. Then Eddie's going to take over and talk about some of the structural modeling and complications that uh, the combustion chamber presents um, and the nozzle. Uh, finally, Yun Peng's going to talk about some of the unsteady cavitation modeling we're doing on our turbo pump inducers. So uh, with that, uh, Ian, if you're here, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Ian Shannon. I'm an FDA analyst at uh, Grayson Major. Uh, I've been with the company since uh, 2018, and I've had a chance to work on projects from fluid flow to thermal and uh, various uh, structural analysis projects. Uh, so on this first slide, I'm going to talk about uh, an application of topology optimization. Uh, here we can see uh, the engine controller uh, assembly uh, and the support bracket that would attach to our Ripley engine. Uh, it's important to get the uh, controller support right for two reasons. Uh, one, it ensures proper isolator operation so that we're uh, protecting sensitive electronics from uh, engine or vehicle vibration. Uh, and second, uh, the support bracket still has to withstand the same uh, loads that any other component on the engine would have to. So we have to maintain structural integrity. Uh, so as far as ensuring proper 
uh, isolator operation. Uh, typically, I've seen this done by making sure that the isolator modes are uh, separated from the flexible body modes. Uh, and then there are uh, multiple approaches, whether it's modal scaling or uh, different uh, acceleration modes to uh, ensure that there is a uh, structurally sound uh, support bracket. Uh, so here we can see what the uh, first flexible body mode of the uh, support bracket would look like. Uh, and the response may be considered acceptable based on the criteria that I described uh, earlier. Uh, but what if you wanted to uh, increase the separation between the isolator modes and the flexible body modes to give yourself a little bit more margin? Or uh, what if you need to improve the structural integrity of uh, the bracket by uh, avoiding any resonances or adjusting any fatigue issues that you had found through the analysis process. Uh, so topology optimization uh, is a great uh, low computational cost tool that can be used to help improve designs. Uh, analysts and designers uh, can fully explore available design spaces in a more automated fashion. And this can be used to help you identify uh, some uh, potential concepts which may or may not be intuitive. Uh, so here is uh, an example of one of the runs that we had done on the uh, bracket. You can see the differences uh, on the lower middle and then the lower right uh, through topology optimization uh, and an effort that took about an afternoon. Uh, we were able to increase the natural frequency uh, of this bracket by about 8%. Uh, which is enough to pad your margins or uh, improve the vibration response of the system. Uh, now moving on to uh, some discussion about uh, 3D printing and simulation at Versa. Uh, as Scott had mentioned, additive manufacturing has really been an enabling technology for a startup like uh, Versa. Uh, but this also means that we need to consider ourselves an additive manufacturing expert just as much as a rocket engine expert uh, so that we can uh, effectively leverage uh, this technology. So, uh, sorry, was someone saying something? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, we're constantly working on improving our knowledge and capability in some uh, specific areas. Uh, such as material properties, so things like uh, material strength, uh, fatigue performance, or even the surface finish is pretty important uh, for us, especially in the analysis domain. Uh, print scaling, uh, ensuring that our critical flow paths are dimensionally accurate. Uh, and then uh, ensuring that we have a high success rate of our prints. Uh, it's a pretty common challenge in the added manufacturing community uh, to prevent parts from cracking or peeling off the build plate or having a uh, recoder blade interference. Uh, so on the left here, you can see our uh, LOX uh, pump housing, uh, which uh, has uh, quite a few uh, complex internal uh, flow paths. Um, and this is something that's really been enabled through uh, the use of uh, added manufacturing. Uh, unfortunately, this does mean that we always can't follow the uh, 3D printing guidelines that are uh, usually uh, required for something like this, especially the uh, overhang or the allocation of support material. Uh, it just isn't feasible uh, to uh, get these in all the locations due to the challenge of removing support material. Uh, so one issue that we're working on improving is uh, the recoder blade interference or uh, blade crash. Uh, this occurs when uh, thermal distortion uh, causes a section of the part to protrude higher than expected, uh, which then uh, causes the device which spreads the next layer of powder to jam. Uh, as a result, uh, the uh, print will have to pause. Uh, you could have some dimensional accuracy issues of the print, or the part may need to be scrapped altogether. Uh, we currently uh, have a lot of back and forth with our print vendors, um, methods to uh, reduce the likelihood of this happening. 
Uh, but we're currently working on uh, exploring the simulation capabilities that we have through ANSYS to see if there are different parameters, orientations, or methods uh, which we can utilize to help improve print success. Uh, I would like to give a big thanks to uh, James Yang from ANSYS and Doug Otis from PADT for uh, helping us uh, through this demonstration and helping getting our team up to speed of what's possible with the added suite in ANSYS. Uh, so in the example here, uh, we can see uh, two different models of the locks housing that I had in the previous slide. Uh, the first is our current build orientation, uh, which keeps everything printing in line with the rotation axis. Uh, and then the next one uh, is a proposed print orientation, uh, which we have uh, the housing itself uh, rotated at a slight angle before attaching it to the build plate. Uh, so if this uh, slight rotation uh, in the uh, build orientation would help reduce any uh, issues with uh, recorder blade jams. Uh, so these two concepts here were run through a transient thermal and static structural analysis to get a layer-by-layer -layer build history. Uh, and then we used an ANSYS ACT uh, to help evaluate the risk of uh, recorder blade jams. Uh, so in these images here, uh, we can see that uh, the blue uh, corresponds to very little autoplane deflection. Uh, the green has slightly more deflection, so there would be an increased risk. And then the red areas have even more deflection, so that's increasing the risk of uh, blade crash. Uh, closing out the ceilings uh, can also be a, a pretty tricky uh, issue just because there's a, a zero degree um, angle to the components. Um, so through simulation, uh, we were able to show on the left side, you can see that there are some uh, areas that are highlighting in red, which would indicate that there is a higher likelihood of encountering some of these blade jam issues. Uh, and then if we look at the proposed orientation, uh, there is a, uh, a reduced risk. Uh, so moving forward, this is something that we could uh, utilize to uh, increase the success rate of our prints. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Eddie uh, to talk about one of his projects. Thanks, Ian. Uh, yeah, so I'm Eddie. I'm one of the other structural analysts here at URSA. And I've been with the company uh, since October, more or less. And before that, I had been doing structural analysis for about eight years at other rocket companies, a little bit of automotive, a little bit of industrial gas turbine. Um, and yeah, today I'll be talking about how ANSYS fits into the analyses that we run on our combustors. So like Scott mentioned a second ago, we, in a way we have two engines on each of our engines. One is that pre-burner, which we use to drive the pump and the other one is obviously the main combustion chamber, uh, which is what you can see in that top right. And these, these always end up requiring really critical analyses because their environments are just so abusive. Um, and on top of that, their failure modes are probably about the most catastrophic things you can encounter on a rocket engine, shy of probably some of the ways in which a pump can fail on you. Um, what I'll be talking about isn't necessarily you know, anything incredibly state-of-the-art like the additive suite. Um, and some of these features aren't, you know, absolutely unique to ANSYS, but I, I do believe that ANSYS's, ANSYS's implementation of what I'll be talking about is incredibly well done, and it saves us a huge amount of time while we are uh, doing these analyses. I think it's one of the areas in which ANSYS really does stand out compared to, to the rest of the FEA software out there. Um, so yeah, so to start, you can see on that top left, kind of a zoomed out shot of what one of our analysis trees starts looking like, you know, by the time that we're a few iterations into one of our uh, designs. And there are kind of two things that, that are worth discussing there. One is that ability to tie uh, two systems together. So for example, we'll run a thermal case and then tie those thermal results into a structural in order to get the stresses that the stress gradients or the thermal gradients are producing and that sort of thing. Um, that's 
yeah, I think a very standard approach in things like air flow design within turbo machinery and definitely, uh, yeah, injectors, combustion chambers, anything like that where you have these, these huge thermals, it's incredibly helpful. Obviously, it's also helpful to do things like pre stress modal analyses, buckling analyses, uh, random vibration analyses, all that stuff. Um, so that's definitely great. And the other thing I really love about uh, yeah, that, that kind of link system approach that it has the ability to just completely clone an entire set of analyses, whether you use that to then piggy bank or piggyback off that to create a slightly different code case or so that you can keep a set of results, you all can pull a new geometry and rebuild it with very minimal in input on your side. But I think when all is said and done, like if, if we've been working on a project for say a month or two, we probably saved, you know, man weeks of time uh, thanks to those little little efficiencies that ANSYS uh, allows for. Uh, then on on that top right, um, you can see kind of what our typical convection profile looks like. So you can see it's spatially varying. Here it was defined within the ANSYS window, but you can, for example, link it to an upstream CSD or, you know, map it in from a, from a CSD file or anything like that. And it, it sounds simple, but most of the FEA software is out there based on NASPREN, and you, you scope loads directly onto the nodes. You typically have to do weird things like scripting if you want to, you know, actually apply a varying uh, profile. If you remesh all and you lose it because you were mapping directly onto your nodes, it, it's just incred an incredible burden uh, on the analysis side, on the pre-processing side to do things like that, even though it seems like it should be very simple. Um, so I do think, yeah, that's one of those areas where ANSYS stands out. I think there's kind of a time and place for every tool. Uh, but, man, I got to say, when it comes to, yeah, things like air boil design, turbo machinery, combustor design, I cannot imagine uh, a world without ANSYS. Um, but, yeah, so, so what you see in this profile is that red contour is probably an order of magnitude larger than uh, – well, I guess there isn't blue in that one, but but yeah, let's say it's it's probably five times greater in magnitude than the green that you see towards the end of the nozzle. Uh, that is our convections, but you know once we got our temperature results, you would basically find the same thing. If you look at the strain results, you're going to find an almost identical uh, profile. And then what that produces is this incredibly wicked uh, thermal grain. So we might see two surfaces that are less than 0.1 inches apart, and they're a 1,000 degrees apart from what each surface operates at. And that then produces this unstoppable classic strains that you can't design your way out of it. But what you do have to do is understand the magnitude of what you're dealing with and have an idea of what kind of impact that has on fatigue. So you can see in the bottom right, uh, that's typically what, what our strain profile will look like. So it's a really heavy biaxial strain state. And then as soon as you turn off the engine, it yielded so much in operation that it also proceeds to yield in the release step. That hysteresis loop uh, will basically cause those strains to very often grow from cycle to cycle. So you have to have a great understanding of that. You have to have material models that, that actually allow you to capture those effects. Um, and yeah, in that regard, ANSYS is just does that all very well. Uh, the solver is, yeah, very stable, even at very high strain levels and stuff. And, yeah, it's just a huge, huge, uh, yeah, time saver and, and a really great tool for that sort of thing. Uh, that's about it on my side. I'll go on to Yenpeng now. Thank you very much, Eddie. Hi, this is Yenpeng Yang. Uh, I'm a staff CFD analyst at Earth, Earth Major. Uh, I'm going to talk about the last pump uh, induced cavitation. As uh, Scott already touched on, double pump is one critical and uh, demanding component of the liquid rocket engine. Uh, we want to minimize the engine weight so that uh, the fuel and oxygen inlet pressure is low. So turbo pump is to raise the uh, liquid I mean, fluids to a significant higher pressure so that uh, uh, efficient, high efficient combustion 
and occur in the main combustion zone. The cavitation is a, a phase change phenomenon uh, when liquid pressure is below its uh, vapor pressure. Uh, as the inlet pressure is low, a uh, turbo pump will likely face cavitation, which may uh, cause a serious performance issue. Uh, one remedy is to add a pump inducer to raise the pressure sufficiently high enough so that the pump, uh, there are no cavitation in the pump space. The cavitation and the inducer design is a science and also an art. We have pushed the uh, envelope deeper that we can have a high efficient design. So understanding dynamic behavior of a organic fluid cavitation is a critical and a fundamental research area at Uh We uh, are still a preliminary stage. We have made a lot of progress in lost pump induced cavitation molding, which I'm going to talk about, and also uh, uh, with the collaboration uh, with the collaboration with um, ADT and uh, ANSYS, we are going to model liquid hydrogen cavitation. Uh, ideally, we want this to be done within the ANSYS suite, and uh, in particular with uh, ANSYS CFX. So on the left, you see that under certain inlet pressure, the operating pressure, the cavitation occurs uh, in the leading edge of the inducer and which shown in the ISO uh, volume of uh, vapor. Uh, also shown here, you can see the velocity uh, streamline showing how the flow goes into the inducer. When we lower the inducer, I mean the inlet pressure further, you can see that uh, cavitation, which is shown blue here, uh, has spread across the inducer domain, uh, which is uh, bad. As I said, that uh, understanding of flow uh, instability is uh, critical. Here on the right, I show uh, two uh, uh, inducer type of modeling. On top, you can see that this is a pressure response with time. You can see that there are uh, no oscillation. And this is confirmed by our testing. In another design, you see there are a lot of uh, uh, oscillation of the pressure signal, uh, which is also validated uh, from the testing. So again, that, um, uh, we have uh, done a lot in the cavitation molding, but a lot more uh, to be done uh, with the help of uh, PADT and ANSYS. So uh, this, uh, I think this is the uh, end of the last slide of uh, our presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Eric, I'll hand back to you. All right. Uh, thanks, guys. I appreciate all that. Um, great insight from your respective domains there um, at URSA and what you're working on. <clears throat> um, at this point, um, we've got a few minutes left in the uh, in the hour here, and we're happy to address a couple questions that have come in from the audience. Um, I'm going to hand this over to Bill now, I guess, to uh, kind of navigate that I will say real quick before we jump into those, um, it looks like we're going to be short on time to uh, cover the ANSYS Cloud. So if you guys would like to learn more about ANSYS Cloud, I encourage you to reach out to us at PADT. Uh, info at PADTinc.com is a, a good email address to use. Uh, and I'll actually post some information here as well on the uh, audience announcement section. Um, and, and more importantly, uh, before I show that, I want to make sure that I share with you the the uh, web address for URSA Major Technologies so you guys can go learn more uh, about them even than what we talked about here today. So Bill, go ahead and uh, take it from here for the uh, questions. Um, I actually have a few that I thought that I may ask, uh, but let's address the uh, 
the customer question or the audience question. I'm sorry, first. Sure. Yeah. Um, so it looks like we have a question. Tell us about multi-species combustion. Um, so I don't have a whole lot to add to that, really. Um, but we we have worked um, with eddy dissipation models and CFX. Um, with a kerosene O2 built-in reaction um, that, that CFX has built in. And we used it primarily for iterating on injector designs um, as a comparative tool. But most of what we've done on the combustion side of things as far as developing our technology has been primarily uh, by running tests and actually doing a lot of single element injector testing uh, at Purdue. So, it's something we're actually working on um, building out our capabilities with and moving into using Fluent um, and starting with the eddy dissipation model of Fluent, but going from there. Um, but that's about all I can go into uh, details on, on what we've been doing with multi-species combustion. Um, it, and I can start the next question. I might uh, send it over to, to Young Peng and Scott here too. But um, we've also done a decent amount of work on, on oxygen um, as a supercritical fluid uh, as part of uh, the preburner combustion process. So the preburner, you have a ton of liquid oxygen uh, coming into the preburner that eventually goes through the supercritical regime at very high pressure. Um, and, and we've done a lot of work with building our own models um, because the temperature ranges are pretty extreme. Um, but I can hand that over to Scott. And maybe, Scott, you could take it from there to talk about some of the pump stuff you guys have done. Sure, yeah. Uh, most of my focus is not necessarily on the supercritical part of the fluid domain, but on the low pressure, uh, vapor pressure. So the, the uh, CFD that Yun Peng presented, uh, cavitation performance, steady and unsteady results for that. Um, it doesn't make a big difference in the turbo machinery as far as supercritical is the way we operate them. Um, I, I'll answer the next. There's a couple more that came in. Uh, are the nozzles cooled or ablative? They are cooled. Um, there was another question, are these engines designed for reuse, reusability? Um, whenever you test a rocket engine on the ground, you're going to test it multiple times. It's always got a fair bit of reusability designed into it. Um, and our engine doesn't require overhaul or rework in between test firings. So I guess that would be yes. Um, and then our exothermic uh, fuels uh, higher energy in the plans. So if you look at our website, uh, Samus is a liquid oxygen hydrogen engine that we're, uh, that we're working on in the background now. And uh, Eddie, uh, you want to look at this uh, LCF question? Yeah, so there was one question asking what tool can we use for low cycle fatigue if it's a commercial product like ENCODE or some sort of in-house code. How do we get fatigue properties for additive, additively manufactured materials? Um, so, so far it, it has all been uh, basically an internally built approach. Uh, we actually did just recently get a few ENCODE licenses because we do expect to start running into a few cases where its capabilities would actually be really helpful. Um, so basically, one on top of, if I remember correctly, already having a very nice uh, right out the box material library or helping you with, with derivations of uh, fatigue curve. And code also has a, a few really great features in terms of uh, being able to basically evaluate fatigue uh, on every single node on and every possible Brain reversal direction on the entire model, which so like on a combustor that doesn't really matter um, because the load case is so the the stress state is so well understood in both the operational and the release step, and you're so uh, low cycle driven because of those thermals I mentioned that you don't really have other considerations like vibrations that really really impact light significantly, um, but there are other cases so. And my previous employer, for example, uh, turbine blade analysis and code was incredibly helpful for because all of a sudden you're not evaluating, you know, at the one very obvious peak stress location. Now there are, say, five contenders. And there are all these competing uh, 
influences in the stress state that change the direction of the stress reversals over time and stuff. And it, it just, what, you know, for me right now might take a little, a 10 minute thing to do it by hand. As you start adding those complexities, all of a sudden you could be at it for hours and you might still miss the real life driving location. So depending on the complexity of your part, yes, ENCODE could absolutely be great. Um, so far, URSA hasn't used it, but, but again, like I said, as, as we kind of build out our capabilities, uh, that's definitely, uh, you know, on the horizon for us. Um, and then as far as mature properties, yeah, I would definitely warn you uh, regarding the, the assumptions that you do make here. So uh, something that, that we do when we're in the development phase is just kind of use whatever properties we can dig up, whether it be in something like MMPDS, which is uh, the sequel to the mail handbook, or anything like that, you know, rough guidance based on the sort of properties you see out of forging. But as we approach more of a like a design ready state for the hardware, we do have to start refining those those assumptions because I don't think it's uncommon for an additively additively manufactured material to have say half the elongation or twenty percent less strength or whatever than what you might see out of forging. In some cases, especially on the really great platforms, it could be superior. But that's a really dangerous assumption to make, especially if if you are in one of these industries where you have to push the factors of safety on the hardware very aggressively due to things like weight considerations. Um, so, like long story short, really at the end of the day, you have to test it. So we have our own test rigs to to verify what kind of properties we're getting out of our build. Um, there's a great NASA document, I believe, from Marshall that goes into their additive manufacturing processing approach. And yeah, long story short there, it's you can't really treat this like an A basis material where, hey, once once you have, you know, a forge or whatever that's that's well set up, you're gonna get this very tight, uh, tightly controlled spread of data batch to batch. Like here if if you're tuning with the printer or if something happens over time and for some reason it just kind of starts uh, uh, wearing on you, all of a sudden you could start getting much lower properties than what you had been used to. So you do need to kind of keep up with that build by build and verify that you are getting what you're designing around. Um, and then as far as the properties, there are also some reasonable assumptions you can make that uh, if you look up, like I think, EFIT might be one of the websites. And there are a few universities that, that have really great slide decks that go into different material models for low cycle fatigue and stuff where if you, for example, know the modulus and the strength of the material, either the elongation, stuff like that, you, you can make, you can get a pretty decent idea of, of where you could be even if you don't have any, any data. And again, obviously, especially as you, you know, get ready to release your hardware for production, you you need to actually confirm what you're assuming because you could definitely make some really dangerous assumptions. All right. Yeah, hey, Eddie, yeah, I, think we're, I think we're going to get chopped. There, okay, there you go. You jump about yeah, there. Yeah, we're, uh, cool. this is Eric here again. I appreciate you guys, uh, your time. We are uh, running up against the end of the call here, so I just wanted to thank everybody. There are a couple unanswered questions that we will answer via, um, via offline here, and we can take care of those. Um, we, uh, again, thank everybody from the URSA major side. This is really cool stuff, and thanks, everybody, for attending. And